Hello. Hi. How are you doing? It's stressed, but I'm good. <laughs> Don't be stressed. It's going to be great. I'm going to ask a really rude question, and you can't hate me for it. Can you say your last name for me? Oh, it's Pimenidu. So imagine the Pimenidu. Yeah, Pimenidu. Yeah. Okay. And where are you headed? I'm not, I'm just, I haven't been able to get confirmation whether Kim is introducing you or I'm introducing you. So these might be. Well, I'm, I'm applying to jobs right now and I am hoping to work in um, Tempus. It's a company in Chicago. Um, but they, it's a, can, it's a pathology lab, basically. So. Okay. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Perfect. Hello. Are you going to do the introduction or am I? Sure, I can do it. I'm ready. Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. I was just, I wasn't sure. I'm going to disconnect my headphones so things might go weird. Hey, Matt. How exciting. Wow. <laughs> what time is it later? I, I, I found my second beer. <laughs> Only two? No, maybe the third. Perfect. How exciting. Thanks for the invite. Sorry how's it going? Confusion about times. I don't know how I did that. Actually, I do know how. I'm I fine. Did. You? Pretty good. You know, we're all doing the quarantine thing still. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Actually, I went to work today. Yeah. But there was well, nobody there. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to figure out, um, you know, what complications we might have to at least allow faculty to get into their labs <clears throat> this summer. Yeah. So, Maria, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, you could share your slides. You should be all oh. set to set up your system. Sorry. Oh, if I don't know if. Oh, here. Your co-host, so you should have full control. Perfect. Nice, I can see you all. They're doing construction at my house. So all day I've been hearing they're breaking up the street. So it's boom, 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 boom. Oh, no. Well, I will make sure to mute myself as soon as I'm done introducing you, Maria, because my dog has been downstairs howling at anything that moves outside today. I don't know what his deal is. So oh. if, there's, if there's hound dog howling in the middle of my introduction, I apologize. I will also add, Maria, if there's any um, internet connections, I might mute your video. So if your video disappears, it's because I did it. Thank you. <laughs> I see Galen is here. <laughs> Deanna, did you make snacks for us all? Um. <laughs> In Gen Chem, we made cookies for lab where they had to change one ingredient. So yesterday, I decided to also participate in the lab. So I've made five different versions of the chocolate chip cookies. Um, I can, and I keep showing them this one, which I oh. just put almond flour in. Ah, yes. So it didn't stick together at all. So nope. I ended up with this tray of delicious cookie gook i bet they taste super good though. ugly but they are super delicious mm -hmm. <laughs> but i could give you a chocolate chip cookie vicariously i have like four dozen cookies <laughs> i shouldn't have brought it up now i just made myself hungry <laughs> oh can i mute myself oh yeah i can mute myself yes Oops, you can sorry Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't been doing any snack related things. I've just been cleaning. Oh, you're the cleaning superhero lately. 
Do you have a cape that you wear as you're like flying around? No, I'll admit I try and wear shorts if I can because I'm flying around so much I get warm in pants. Yeah, yep. No, um, I'll be probably shooting another video tomorrow or Friday to show my progress in the teaching lab. The research lab is... I heard it's the... so spotless, it's lickable. <laughs> I mean, at least when I wipe the counter, there's not pink color coming up anymore. Good, good. I'm sure it's only mildly carcinogenic. Sorry, I'm just gonna add Molly. At some point, I will need to hear your voice or see your face to confirm it's actually you there for credit for the class. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but I've decided to do that and now I have to keep doing it. Fabulous. Kate, you're looking very closely to the camera. <laughs> Taking a nap by the computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> now far away. Little Kate, big Kate, little Kate. <laughs> you get that close, you can't you can't fake if your eyes are open or not. <laughs> I don't know who's on iPad too, but if you need class attendance, you'll have to tell me who you are. I think that's my mom. <laughs> okay, perfect. I just needed to, <laughs> that's fine. I just wanted to check. Um, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm super excited just to have um, the fourth of our senior experience talks. We do have 20 of them, so we're we're cranking through and um, we're gonna have two exciting talks today. They will be in two different Zoom sessions. So if you do wanna hang out and talk to Maria for a minute, that will be more than, you'll be more than able to do that. Um, I don't really have much more to say than that, but thank you for being here and joining us and spending some of your time with us over Zoom. And I will pass it off to Kim to introduce our speaker. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm sure you all, are, all already know Maria quite well because I don't think you can exist on Lawrence campus and not know Maria. Um, so, but it's my pleasure to introduce her for this talk, uh, for her senior experience talk, because I've had the pleasure of knowing you now, Maria, since you were a first year student. Um, and I remember those days fondly when um, somehow I managed to convince you to take geology and explore different sciences and, and really um, be the great liberal arts student that you are. And, and you did, and you took theater and you did all sorts of different stuff your first year. And, um, and in true form, you came back your sophomore year and you were like, now it's time to focus. And, um, and so you did, and you dug into biochemistry and started making progress in that major, but then next thing I know, you're doing econ too. And then next thing I know, you're sitting in my office saying, you know, I really need to be engaged and I really need to do stuff on campus and feel like I'm having an impact on the world around me. And, um, and so next thing I know, you're in LUCC and not just like dabbling, but serious about it. And all of that has led to um, such an interesting you know, end product here where um, you have so much expertise in biochemistry and econ, but you've taken that out of the classroom too and done research experiences, your LUCC president, um, you've done all these amazing things on campus and off. Um, and so you have a lot to be proud of and it's really a, an honor to be here at your senior experience talk and hear about some of your work at MD Anderson Cancer Center, or yes, Cancer Crossed Out Center. Um, and think about where all this is gonna lead you um, in the future in biotechnology or, um, or somewhere in, with leadership roles in science and econ and all those things. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kim. And I wanna thank both Kim and Deanna for 
Yeah, I'm helping for this presentation, but Kim for being my advisor the past four years. So my project today uh, is on the synthesis of deuterated 2-deoxyglucose compounds to inhibit, to inhibit the metabolism of tumors. And I did this project while I was working uh, in the MD Anderson Cancer Center in the summer of 2018 with the sarcoma lab. Uh, so in my presentation, I will give you some reasons of like why should we care about cancer research and why it is, it is important. And then I will give you an idea behind the motivations and the mindset uh, behind the sarcoma, the, the research of the sarcoma lab on deuterated compounds and their impact on the metabolism of glucose. Uh, and then I will finish off uh, the presentation with my part in this bigger, uh, bigger project uh, in cancer research. So to start. Uh, to start, uh, I would like to start with um, explaining what cancer is and what are, are, are its defining features. So cancer is the rapid creation of abnormal cells that grow beyond their usual boundaries and which can then invade uh, adjoining parts of the human body and spread to other organs, uh, which this process is called metastasis, metastasizing. So in the image, we can see all the normal cells. And then the blue ones are the cancer cells, which grow very rapidly and can um, uh, and can invade the normal cells. Uh, they can break through the cell membrane and then as I said they can spread to any other parts of the body um, or other organs of the body and that is why this is like one of the most dangerous features of cancer because um, if you get cancer in your brain or your, uh, in your pancreatic uh, we have pancreatic ca uh, cancer, it's very, very hard to treat um, and it's, it's very dangerous. Um, so I thought I would start with some key facts because it's very easy to kind of see what is important when we see the numbers and the impact that it has in the world. So cancer is the second leading uh, cause of uh, death globally and it's responsible for 9.6 million deaths in 2018 and that's the last we had data on cancer deaths and about one in six uh, deaths globally are due to cancer uh, so these numbers are huge and we can see that it really affects all people of all uh, socioeconomic backgrounds in any continent across the world about 70% of deaths from cancer occur in low and middle income, uh, income countries. Um, and that's because cancer treatments or even cancer prevention treatments um, today are very costly and are not, are not time effective because if you, and I will talk about this later on, but especially for those that have to provide for their families, uh, they do not have the luxury of missing work and, uh, and going for the multiple and numerous cancer treatments that are needed to get rid of tumors. Um, the developing world and its citizens have less access to cancer treatment, so that is why when we, we see such a large percentage of deaths um, in low and middle income countries. Um, and, oh, can't see the arrow here. Uh, and the economic impact of cancer is uh, significantly is increasing every year more and more. In 2010, which was the last time uh, we had data on this, about 1.6 trillion uh, U.S. dollars were spent just in the U.S. Um, for, you know, research, uh, for, for, for econ not research, for the economic costs, so in terms of uh, treatment. And this number has at least tripled uh, because uh, cancer deaths and cancer cases have tripled since 2010 as well. So here I, ha I have the other continents and then the percentage uh, of cancer death rates that it, uh, each continent accumulates. Uh, so while it's not adjusted for population densities, so we know that in Asia we have the highest population of any continent, we can still see the very interesting differences between let's say Asia and Africa uh, which have the highest population, but also have the highest, um, the greatest difference between number of cases. So that's another problem. There's not, um, it's indicative of like low and not as good report of data. Uh, but also uh, we can see, I mean, in the Americas and Europe, we also have a very, very high percentage of uh, cancer death rate. So investigating into cancer research is very important, not only like statistically, uh, but also because it impacts so many people uh, worldwide. So what is available right now for cancer uh, patients uh, in terms of treatment? So in this slide, I thought this was a very good slide because these are the general uh, sections. So we have hormone therapy, surgery, bone marrow trans uh, transplant, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, radiation therapy, and immunotherapy. And most of us probably have heard this uh, in, everyday, in everyday life. 
Uh, but all of these fall into three different categories. And uh, for me, instead of talking specifically pros and cons for each one of them, I will talk about them in like their bigger sections. So either they're radiation therapy, surgery, which most of them fall under surgery. And then we have systematic therapy, which will be the focus of today's uh, this talk on. Um, so here I have this table. Oh. I guess I don't have a table. Uh, so here I have the, um, the cancer treatments and a kind of an overview of what each one of them do. So we here I have the healthy, the healthy cancer cell uh, over here, the cancer cells, I guess, the cancer cells are in, in green and the healthy cells are in brown. And we see that with radiation therapy, um, we have a lot of dead cancer cells, but we also have a lot of dead normal healthy cells, uh, which is not very, it's not very ideal. And then with surgery, we have a lot of um, cancer cells that um, are taken out through surgery, and we have some less, less, um, um, less normal cells are harmed in the process through surgery. And then we have systematic therapy, uh, which is kind of similar to surgery, but we have um, more cancer cells that are still uh, persistent after that treatment. Uh, so I guess, I guess this is a good slide for an overview of the pros and cons, but I have also this table where it's, you don't have to uh, worry about reading, I would just want to give an overview of each one of them and then why we need to invest in more <clears throat> feasible and more economically feasible ways of treating cancer. So in uh, radiation therapy, I said one of the uh, pros is that there is a death of a large portion of the cancer cells um, and it works um, it works with usually with systematic therapy so they work in uh, they work together to kind of be more effective and uh, it, there is a lot um, there's a lot of stimulation of uh, because of the immune response uh, but a lot of as we said before there's a lot of damage in the surrounding tissues and there is the problem of metastatic disease so the cancer continuing to multiply and move to other organs of the of the body and there is uh, it is inconvenient because it takes multiple uh, sessions to reach the desired effect and then we have surgery which uh, removes again large volumes of the tissue uh, and also it can uh, remove like in like microscopic um, um, cancer cancer cells, uh, but it's, um, it's not as successful as um, the radiation therapy for that. And there is some damage in the nearby normal tissues. And again, there is a problem of the metastatic disease because this is common for, especially for the first two, because even after these treatments, uh, cancer cells will still uh, stay in the body, in that organ. And then we have systematic therapy. Uh, which can kill many cancer cells throughout the entire body. But the problem with that is that it's not very efficient as of right now, as of the treatments available in the, in the market. So the, you need to use it with radiation, which kind of takes away from systematic therapy not being as harmful as radiation because you have to use it with radiation. Um, but the nice thing about systematic therapy is that it's very tailored to each um, type of patient and to each, to each type of tumor. Um, as I said, it's uh, unable to kill a tumor alone, and there are some systematic toxicities, especially for certain drugs, uh, because you're introducing something new in the body uh, that's supposed to stay and kill uh, the cancer cells. So, uh, but that's that's pretty rare. Um, so yeah, these are the pros and cons, and I kind of wanted to emphasize this because I wanted to see like what are better things that we can think of in terms of treatment that are not are not as harmful and more effective. So here we have, um, I want to talk about the biological response modifiers, which are a type of systematic therapy, so the third type. So um, this, um, this type of therapy is also called immunotherapy, and it's a type of treatment that mobilizes the body's immune system to fight cancer. So the therapy mainly consists of stimulating the immune system to help it do its job more effectively. Uh, so cancer cells a lot of times have uh, inhibitors that will suppress um, will suppress par uh, parts of the of the organs that fight cancer. So biological response modifiers kind of amp the immune response. They're able to trigger the immune system and other natural processes in the body to indirectly affect tumors, and that's what we will be talking about today. Um, so this uh, this strategy involves giving large amounts of these BRMs by injecting or infusing uh, into the hope in hope of stimulating the cells of the immune system to act more eff effectively. 
They're also called, as I say here, immuno immunomodulators and immunostimulants. So immunomodulators are basically what it sounds like, chemical agents that modify the immune response or the functioning of the immune system. And immunostimulants are substances that stimulate the immune system uh, by increasing the activity of one of its components. So in recent years, uh, the investigation of how we can inhibit cancer cells metabolism has been um, very it has been very looked in looked upon uh, since it's significantly different from healthy cell metabolism and has become a rapidly developing research paradigm. So so how uh, so let's talk about cancer metabolism and why it can be different from healthy cell metabolism. So in 1927, Otto Warburg, this guy over here, published a paper titled "The Metabolism of Tutors in the Body." Uh, in the Journal of General Physiology. And there he and his colleague came to one important conclusion, that cancer cells, above all other diseases, have countless of secondary causes. But even for cancer, there's only one prime cause, which is basically the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in normal body cells by the fermentation of sugar. So a few years later, in 1931, he received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, uh, and he really started the research um, into how can we inhibit the metabolism of cancer cells uh, in that way by inhibiting just the, uh, the different cancer metabolism or not hard, harming the healthy cells. Um, then what he found was that um, even in the presence of abundant oxygen, uh, so cancer cells will always choose glycolysis for ATP production, and that was coined as the Warburg effect. And studies after that have also shown that <clears throat> even for cancer, uh, cancers and tumors in the lungs where there's a lot of oxygen, uh, cells will still use glycolysis um, by majority. So the main takeaway is that <clears throat> is that sugar matters, and that we can use this to inhibit inhibit tumor cells and starve them. So I made this a new meme. I think it's very popular with cancer cells, and instead of using oxidative phosphorylation, they choose glycolysis. So, so I want to look into now that we've established the main general difference uh, between the between cancer cells and healthy cells, and I wanted to look a bit more into detail and kind of explain and walk you through this. So. We have a differentiated tissue, so a healthy, normal tissue in our body. In the presence of oxygen, it will produce glucose, but then it will go through the Krebs or TCA cycle and produce CO2 and 36 moles of ATP per mole of glucose. So that's oxidative phosphorylation, which is the most common because it produces a lot of energy. Uh, in the absence of oxygen, which is pretty rare for healthy cells, they will, use, they will just go through glycolysis, so anaerobic glycolysis, and produce two moles of ADP per mole of glucose. Now, what happens with a proliferative tissue or a tumor tissue, a uh, cancer tissue, is that even, even in the absence or presence of oxygen, uh, cells will use majority just glycolysis to produce lactate, uh, through aerobic glycolysis, the Warburg effect, and have a total of four moles of ADP per moles of glucose. So we see a very small percent of the pyruvate produced goes through the Krebs cycle. Uh, so we can see that that is very, there is far less efficient in producing energy, but it is believed that tumors uh, using glycolysis have some sort of growth advantage over tumors using the Krebs cycle. So here is the here is the an overall picture of glycolysis for those that uh, have not taken as much biology. I mean, I feel, I feel like everyone, <laughs> all of us know the basics, but this is an overview, and I wanted to show how long and the complex of a chain it is, um, and there are a lot of steps in producing those um, those moles of ADP. Um, so. Yeah, we have two distinct phases, and the six carbon ring of glucose um, is cleaved into a two, three carbon sugar of pyruvate through uh, different enzymes. Uh, but the important thing is focusing on the three first steps uh, where we can where the inhibition can occur and we can break um, we can break um, the chain uh, and not have the Warburg effect uh, happen in cancer cells. So how can we break the chain? So this happens with deuterated molecules. Um, to understand deuterated molecules, we need to know what a deuterium is. So 
we have three isotopes of hydrogen. So deuterium is, the, is known as the heavy uh, hydrogen, which is heavy because it has another neutron in it. So this is normal hydrogen, and then this is uh, deuterium with an extra neutron in it. This basically doubles its weight. So these two are an isotope pair with a large percentage difference in weight. Uh, the reason this weight difference makes a, um, makes a difference is that when a, broke, when a bond breaks uh, between the hydrogen or the deuterium and another atom, if that bond breaking is an important step in, in the process, in some process of the drug, um, um, oh, sorry. Uh, you, can slow the, you can slow the breaking down of the bond by putting a deuterium atom where the hydrogen used to be. So for drugs, this is very important because a lot of them are just metabolized and destroyed very fast when they reach the liver. And this is uh, often done with just breaking the carbon and hydrogen bond. So you can slow that process with replacing carbon and deuterium. Um, and this can have a huge significance in how long a drug, a drug will circulate through the bloodstream and it can slow down the liver's uh, clearance mechanism. So in drug development <coughs> uh, programs, the deteriorated versions of drugs are commonly generated to study the metabolism of a drug because we can identify those because of the presence of, of deuterium. So that's also another uh, reason why we deuterate drugs because then we can find them within the body because their mass is so different. So what is the deuterated drug that we will be using or the, the project will be using in order to inhibit glycolysis? And that is uh, 2-deoxy-D-glucose. So here we have a normal glucose molecule and then we have our 2-DG, uh, which we can see the difference here is in uh, red. So in glycolysis, 2-DG is able to be phosphorylated which is the chemical addition of a, a phosphoryl group by hexokinase, resulting in the formation of 2-deoxyglucose phosphate. And the product of this reaction will be trapped within the cell and will not be used, cannot be used in subsequent steps of glycolysis, resulting in the accumulation of this, um, of this compound here, of 2-DG phosphate, and it will cause uh, product inhibition of HK2, which is an enzyme um, that can suppress cancer metabolism. So by a lot of, accumul uh, by high accumulation of this, uh, we will have um, this uh, inhibition of this enzyme that will help in suppressing cancer metabolism. And it can really help um, with fighting um, cancer, cancer cells and their abnormal growth. So, Oops. Oops. Sorry. Uh, so how does the inhibition exactly occur? So I wanted to just explain the mechanism. Um, so as a refresher here, we have the three first steps of glycolysis with normal D-glucose. Uh, but now if we substitute D-glucose with 2-DG uh, over here, we see that the second step um, a phosphoglucose isomer isomerase is blocked and this process is irreversible. So um, when, um, when this, this um, molecule um, is produced, uh, it cannot go back or used for something else in the body. So as I explained earlier, we will just have a lot of this compound in the body that, as I mentioned before, will inhibit the enzyme that can suppress cancer metabolism. Um, and it can also, this, this will efficiently slow uh, cell growth and also facilitating the process of apoptosis or autophagy, which autophagy is the a natural process which happens in our body that we can clear out our, the damaged cells. Um, so this is the, the mechanism that after we produce this compound, that compound cannot be used um, further on. So yeah, so 2-DG blocks glycolysis by an ability to undergo isomerization to do to D fructose. So now that we have established the basics of the processes behind this research, I can talk more about what the uh, Sarcoma Lab and Dr. Priebe's team uh, is working on currently and was working on while I was there. So as I mentioned before, uh, researchers have theorized that if you can block a tumor's access to glucose, you can essentially starve the tumor out of existence because tumors have no other way really to metabolize efficiently. So previous attempts at targeting the metabolism of tumor cells have failed due to their rapid metabolism and lack of drug-like properties of the drugs being investigated. Uh, efforts to target tumor metabolism in the brain were further 
uh, slowed by the inability to get these glycolytic inhibitors into the brain in sufficient amounts uh, because of the blood-brain barrier. So it was very hard for 2DG to really reach the blood-brain barriers. But <clears throat> the molecule lab created WP1122, which is very similar to 2DG. It's not exactly this, um, this structure, but it's very similar. Uh, and it's a pro-drug which increases cellular uptake uh, increases ha drug half-life and also increases the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier, enabling greater uptake in the brain. So this drug would be very, very helpful, especially for uh, brain cancers. So their approach was inspired by the same principle that distinguishes morphine, uh, morphine from heroin. Uh, heroin is chemically the diacetyl ester of morphine, while morphine has a limited ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, its DSD form heroin has the ability to accumulate in the brain by 10 to the 100 fold more than mor morphine. So one, it cross, once it crosses the blood brain barrier, the acidic groups shown here in, the chemi in this diagram sorry, um, are clipped off by natural enzyme. And then we have pure morphine that ends up and accumulates in the brain. So the same, the, the, the lab wanted to use the same um, idea uh, with the WP1122, which is similar to 2DG, in order to make it cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so based on preclinical testing, it was seen that just like herring, WP1122 crosses the blood-brain barrier, where its acetyl groups are cleaved off, allowing the resulting 2DG um, to accumulate in the brain at a much higher rate than the free 2DG can do itself. And WP1122 has a much longer half-life than the free form 2DG because we've, we have deuterized it, as I mentioned before. Um, so it, it's more, it makes it more feasible to deliver quantities that are adequate for therapeutic effect. Also, st animal studies have shown that um, the, the drug, the project structure of WP1122, uh, results in accumulation in other organs, including the uh, pancreas, which make it a really good candidate for targeting both pancreatic cancer and brain, brain cancer. Uh, here I have a picture of, that is from, the, from their website, and this is the current, um, current drug that is used for pancreatic and brain cancer, and this is the WP1122, and we can see that the cancer over a period of time is actually more efficient than their com the competitor that is currently in the market. So I wanted to, the same principle that drives tumor cells to overconsume glucose allows for PT scanning to highlight the size and the location of tumors by imaging radio labeled glucose decoys that are taken up by tumor cells in sub substantially higher concentrations than normal cells. So it's basically the same principle that we've been talking about, but I want to give you an example of how it's been used, um, but differently. So here we have an example of a PET scan with 2DG, uh, which in, is integrated in the, in the body. Uh, and we can see that we are able to detect uh, metabolically active uh, tumors. So this, so here instead of having a deuterium, we have a, a fluoral, a, a deuterated fluorine, and it accumulates in the body because it's not metabolized, and then it can go through a PET scan, and we're able to see very clear where the tumor is. I wanted to give a comparison between an MRI and, a, and a, a, like a more recent uh, fluoral f 18 PT scan, and we can see in the MRI scan, you can barely see the tumor, uh, and, the, and here you can very clearly see it. And what's good about this is that before, um, when you, only MRI was used, you couldn't really see the progress if the tumor was getting bigger or smaller after treatment. Um, so this really um, helps with um, making modifications in the therapeutic regimens. Uh, because you can see if it's going well, if it's not going well. And in about 27% of patients, the course of management was changed because of um, this type of PT scanning, which is amazing. And here I have an example of both of the concepts combined into one. So we have the fluoro, uh, we have the, um, sorry, the 2-deoxy, 2-fluoro uh, glucose, PET scan before and after it was treated with 2DG. So this is a 
humor that was treated with two deoxy glucose and that was the after. So, <laughs> so we have talked about this background uh, and I've talked about all the steps that I had to go through in order to understand why I was doing this project. Um, so my project is in this bigger 2DG research uh, in cancer treatments was really figuring out how can we make the creation of WP1122, this drug that the lab was creating, um, with a very uh, good analytical methods and a way in order for us to verify whether we have produced the, the compounds that we were expecting. Uh, we can't, during a, while you're making a product, you cannot guess what to expect, but you really need high quality data to make predictions because guesses are not good enough when you're creating a drug that will end up in a patient and in people's bodies. Um, and the quality control needs to be very high. So my job was really looking into how can we make this process very analytically rigorous. So, so finding, um, finding ways where we can say, this is the process and we know for sure that this is what we got because we know, we know that this is very similar to that. So my primary job uh, was, cre was creating rigorous analytical methods of internal standards. So what the main purpose of internal standards is checking whether we, what we're expecting in the process is actually happening, and thus we can compare the two things that are similar or that we expect to be similar. Uh, having to guess about properties of what we're making, um, so we can, when we create a, a compound that has similar properties, uh, and no, so when we have a compound that we know that that's what we're expecting, we can see its properties and then test our final compound and see whether the two properties match. So it really allows us to normalize data through very diverse biological systems where we can compare the signals between what we have and what we, uh, what we expect. Um, and uh, yeah, and this was my job. And Diana can tell you that this, was, this is a very hard thing to, to do and it takes a lot of time uh, and figuring out a way to do it is a it's a pretty hard task uh, so now i'll give you an overview of exactly what my part was so our molecule of interest is wp1122 and my job was to create these three compounds in order for them to then for, for the, in order for these three internal standard compounds to be analyzed in NMR and mass uh, spectrometry and then possibly, <clears throat> possibly many other types of analysis in order, to, in order to then compare the analysis that we would get from the compound and the drug that we're creating versus things that we already know what we've created and analyzing the two. So, oh, let me take a break. So um, my main job was finding ways to do the synthesis of these and then producing a lot of NMR and mass spec data. Uh, so the first, um, the first synthesis that I did, it was is a very known synthesis um, and it's something that the lab that I was working at had already done. And it was the synthesis of a mono deuterated 2TG. Um, I mean, I don't think I, I will go into much detail in this synthesis, but you can clearly see that we have added, um, or our intention was to add the deuterated um, compound right here. And then the synthesis for the dye and tri-deuterated 2DGs, the starting synthesis was the same. So uh, we created this product. And then from there, uh, we could create the 2DG, the, the deuterium, um, and then again, using the same starting product, um, create tri -deterium. I wanted to include here an NMR uh, graph with the, um, for, what we, for what we expected, uh, but I will talk more about this and compare the, the three compounds towards the end, um, but I just wanted to give everyone an idea. Yeah, so if we didn't have deuterium, so we'd expect some peaks right here. And then, as I said, we're using the same starting compound uh, as we did for dieteterated 2DG to produce the tridiuterated 2DG. And here we have, again, an NMR for these. And if we didn't have these three deuteriums right here, we would expect some peaks in this area. Um, so this is the NMR spectra results compared between uh, these three compounds. I did not include the monodeuterated 2DG because um, that was, I, I felt like that was not um, very needed. I really wanted to focus on the 
the adding the, the dye and chai deuteriums and comparing them with um, a molecule that did not have any deuteriums on it. So as I mentioned before, we can see that these peaks right here, well, I guess we can see that they're all kind of the same molecule because we have all the same peaks right here, uh, which are very similar to each other because overall they do have the same structure. Um, and then we can see all of them have some sort of peaks right here for carbon for carbon two. Um, the one that has no deuteriums, of course, has bigger peaks because there's nothing pulling it, um, pulling them and making them smaller. And then we have the difference, uh, which is very clear between the non-deuterized and the di and tri-deuterized, which are these two peaks uh, for carbon six because that's where we have our deuteriums. Um, and then. I also wanted to zoom in and just give an example of uh, where we can see the deuterium peaks. So this is for the dye deuterated, and right here we can see these two peaks, one for each deuterium. Um, now we have some mass spec results. Uh, unfortunately, I only got my hands on the mass spec results for uh, the dye deuterated to DG, but it, it's kind of the same mentality that was used for all the other ones. Um, so here we can see that the, the main, the main um, fragment here is over here, 190. Uh, and this is the compound that we expected with a mass of 167. Actually, if you subtract 190 from 167, which is what we expected, it comes exactly at 23, which happens to be the mass of sodium. And after talking with my advisor and based on her experience, we 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 knew it was because of purification because I, I ran this mass spec right after synthesis. So I didn't have the chance to really go through a lot of purification steps, but it still shows pretty clearly and pretty well that this is what we got. It has the right mass. Um, and of course we can see that it's not the purest of all, uh, but it still points out that that's, that the, that's the mass that we expected. Um, so yeah, so moving forward, I think, I think it's all the all the things that I've I've presented today. The most important is to remember that glucose matters a lot when we're talking about sugar matters a lot when we're talking about uh, the metabolism of cancer cells, and the things that I've created um, will be used in the lab and will be all the synthesis and NMR uh, and mass spec that I run will be used in creating this drug uh, WP eleven twenty two. Um, and I mean, cancer, cancer research is done in like baby steps and I'm very lucky to have been part of one of those. And this is the, the team I was working with. Here are my sources. Thank you so much. I will open the floor to questions if you want to chat them or ask them or whatever. Any questions? Am I missing someone? So I guess that my question would be, as you're doing this, um, creating these standards with this expectation that you're going to use them in the next step, what do you think was the most difficult aspect of this process? Where did you see your biggest challenge in the process with what you did over the summer? Uh, one of the one of the biggest challenges was really being in the lab like by yourself and kind of figuring out and being independent and not constantly going to my advisor my advisor for this specific one was Isabella for the synthesis and she really wanted uh, me to to do my research by myself and figure out like what has already been done before, which is something that I I hadn't I had never done. Uh, so really feeling confident and um, confident in my work and um, like yeah, I guess I guess that was that was the hardest part because it was the first time that I, I was able to do this. And then that, another part was again it's kind of paired really figuring out like what is happening because there's a lot of information that all these people that work in the sarcoma lab already know, but I had like a week, a week and a half to kind of read a lot of papers, figure out why glucose matters, um, figure out like what's the inhibition process and all of these steps. So it was a lot of information, but um, it also helped me really grow in my ability to, 
you know, be confident that, yeah, you can do this. It's not, <laughs> it's not, well, I guess it was hard, but it's not impossible. <laughs> Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I have a question that's, um, that's probably more molecular biology related, but um, I'm wondering, so to use this, these deuterated glucose compounds as a treatment for cancer, um, I mean, it's handy that they accumulate where you want them to and they can cross blood brain barriers and those sorts of things. Um, but cancer cells are sort of notorious for undermining one therapy, right? And um, adjusting gene expression or mutating or things to, um, to overcome the effects of one drug or one treatment. So does that, how readily does that happen with this kind of treatment? And, um, and so how effective sort of long-term can it be? Or is this the kind of drug or treatment that you would use in conjunction with some other things? Yeah, I think um, definitely, and they had done some like pre preliminary um, studies in like in, in, my, in mice model. So I kind of showed um, their graphs, but it was something that uh, they would do every day. So I remember um, the drug that the, the WP1122, they would inject it in mice actually twice a day um, over a month, over 30, 38 days. Um, so it's definitely something that is not in terms of efficiency and contrasting it to other what other treatments are out there is not yet as efficient as it could be um and i think it, it would definitely need um it would need to be paired with some sort of radiation um uh, at least in the beginning phases for it to be 100 percent effective because it is a part of it is part of a systematic therapy um, and as you said, like cancer cells are very known for um, going over uh, and finding ways to suppress uh, different inhibitors and enzymes. So, but I didn't, I didn't look a lot into how effective that would be um, because they're still, they're still testing it and they're still in the process of um, getting approvals to do a human, to do it on humans. And Thank you. Questions? Oh, is there something in there? No, that's me. Don't worry. <laughs> so, I guess I will ask one other thing. You know, you talked both about the imaging aspects and the treatment aspects. Do you see one of these things as more promising than the other, or do you see both of these as? equally promising aspects of the 2DG and the deuterated yeah. 2DG. Definitely, definitely the imaging is way more promising and it's being used for like a couple of years now. Uh, and it's, it just, it, it has been working really well. Um, and it's being used like, uh, like in real time because the, the 2DG has been used, but it's, as I said, it's not, and as Kim said, it's not as uh, efficient. Um, either it can be metabolized very fast or it's not in enough concentrations in the brain or in where the, the cancer tumors is. So this is definitely more um, prominent and is more successful so far. And I mean, even the differences, I think this is a very good picture, like the differences between an MRI uh, and a PT scan. It just shows like how um, promising this is. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I would like to thank Maria again for giving us such thank a wonderful talk. Yay. Um, I accidentally sent the link to this talk first, but if you would like to join us to Evan's talk, that will be right after this in another Zoom session. But if you do have questions for Maria that you want to ask one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to hang out and ask her. And otherwise, I look forward to seeing you whenever I see you next in our next talk. We have two more talks um, on Friday, starting at 310 and then um, at 4 o'clock. And that will be, um, Galini will be giving the one at 310 and then Katie will be giving the talk at 4 o'clock. So we will hopefully see you soon. And otherwise, ask Maria a question or maybe join us at the other Zoom meeting. I'm going to make you host, Maria. I'm going to open.
I'm gonna open Evans. I don't know if it's gonna boot you out. I've not tried to do this yet. So okay. if I lied, <laughs> maybe I'll make Kim, Kim, are you gonna hang here for a minute? Um, if Kim's gonna hang here for a minute, it I will unmute so you can hear me. Yes, I will hang out. <laughs> okay, if, um, you will have to make Kim the host now because now I no longer have control. <laughs> It won't Kim. Kim, boot Kim out, for sure. Oh, I am the host now. I have the power. Okay, so I, <laughs> I will have to leave and go do the other one, but I, I think now that Kim owns it, it won't shut down when I open another Zoom. Okay? If it does, I'm really sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Great job. You should be really proud of your work. Thank you.